Europe's refugee crisis is no longer in the headlines, but thousands of migrants continue to arrive on its shores, seeking a better place. Welcome to Straight Talk Africa. Um, more than 70 million people are forcibly displaced worldwide. Among them are over 25 million refugees who have fled across international borders and are unable to return to their homes. The discussion about the solutions to the refugee crisis is coming up right here on Straight Talk Africa. Joining me today are uh, Elizabeth Lizama, Communications and Social Media Coordinator for the International Organization for Migration, INBO VOA reporter and co-host of VOA's Our Voices, and Luel Mayen, CEO of Junub Games, uh, joining us from Geneva is, in Switzerland is VOA correspondent Lisa Bryan, and by phone from still Geneva is Kenda Negash, President and CEO of the U.S. Committee on Refugees and Migrants. I want to welcome all of you to Straight Talk Africa. Thank you so much for having us. So Lisa, let me come to you in Geneva. What is the latest development regarding the conference? Well, the talks have uh, just wrapped up, and um, there were a number of pledges uh, of, of a number of billions of dollars. Um, the World Bank, uh, the Inter-American Development Bank, uh, businesses, uh, individuals, and states. And so, you know, there was some financial pledges. Um, there were apparently a lot of in-kind pledges. So uh, the UNHCR, which hosted the conference, said something like more than 770 pledges, uh, anything from money to legal assistance as pro bono, jobs, job skills training. I mean, it's just been sort of a, a conglomerate of things. And I think the bigger thing is that this is the first ever of its kind, this kind of global refugee forum that also is bringing in refugees so that they can talk about their plight and also um, be in, on the table in terms of solutions. So. Uh, you would have to ask UNHCR, but it really was, um, you know, it was, a, it was perhaps a game changer for them. Mm. So, Lisa, you've been speaking with some of these participants. So what has been the feedback that you've gotten from some of these participants so far? Well, it's been, I've spoken to a mix of participants, and the feedback has been um, sort of various. Um, I spoke to uh, refugees who say that they really should be at the table and make the decisions of um, issues that really concern them. I've talked to um, developing countries that are hosting refugees. Uh, for example, uh, some of the delegates in, from Cameroon and also Ethiopia, and they really need more assistance from um, developed countries. Um, I spoke to people who are working in terms of clean energy businesses and also um, members of the humanitarian community, and they um, are really trying to push clean energy in refugee camps, which is a very interesting um, an interesting concept. So very different responses um, in terms of uh, everybody is coming at this from a, a different point of view. With the recent surge in refugees, um, do you sense or is there a political will to handle this problem and address it pragmatically? I think you need to ask experts for this, but I mean, I live in Paris, in France, and um, I, you know, the refugee crisis is ongoing. Um, we've seen, you know, thousands and millions of people trying to find better lives. Everybody says climate change is going to make it even more difficult. And governments, not all, but a number of governments are closing their doors. So I think it's going to take much more than uh, one refugee conference to change mindsets of governments and also of people. Before you leave us, uh, Lisa, what do you make of the outcome of this conference? Is there a commitment to expedite the solution or implement the solution to resolve these uh, con concerns with the refugees? I think that, you know, having a, you know, a 
uh, you know, this conference, a two-day conference that was in some ways three days, really is important to have people around the table to discuss the issues, all the people that are involved with it. But I think these, I think everybody would probably agree that these are very complex questions that demand long-term solutions. So I think the fact that people are together talking is really good, but I think that having a really fast answer is, is probably not realistic. But I think that, you know, the fact that there were so many pledges and that they were quite substantial and that is obviously a step forward. Thank you very much Lisa. Let me come to you um, Elizabeth. Today is International Migrants Day and what would your organization focus on? Sure. Um, so as you mentioned with the global picture of forced migration, we see that there are more than 70 million people who have been forcibly displaced. And unfortunately, there's not a simple solution. And sometimes resettlement might be the viable option. In other instances, we might be able to offer voluntary return to their country of origin. But um, as we continue to see these issues in conflict continue and um, we have displaced persons in host communities. This year for International Migrants Day, we wanted to focus on integration and social cohesion um, and really celebrating migrant stories, but also the host communities that are welcoming refugees and migrants around the world. So whether it be socioeconomic integration and creating livelihood opportunities or even cultural integration and finding opportunities where communities can get together for whether it's the arts or music. Um, so that is, is the focus of this year's International Migrants Day. All right, let, let me go to Eskender. Can you hear me, Eskender? Yes, I can. Now, you are in Geneva. Give me your overview about the two-day conference. Great. Uh, you know, the first thing I, I can tell you, there were uh, about 2,000 people came to this conference. Uh, I also noticed that a lot of head of states came to attend the meeting. And the, the gathering was kind of co-convened by uh, a number of countries. Some of them are refugee hosting countries, like Costa Rica, Ethiopia, uh, Pakistan, and Turkey. I mean, as you know, in Turkey, there are nearly you know, uh, 4 million or more Syrian refugees. So it's a, Big, big gathering, and I think Lisa mentioned to you that a number of countries, uh, private companies, uh, uh, the governments have pledged uh, uh, millions of dollars. Uh, I worry that these pledges may be not binding pledges, even though some of them are probable uh, uh, pledges, but they, they cash pledge from the different countries, millions of dollars, private uh, corporation. Uh, it, it's, it's, a, it's something I had never seen before, and I've been uh, coming to Geneva for a refugee meeting for many years, but this is quite different. Uh, and if the pledges are really uh, materialized, I, I have a feeling that UNHCR will be in a different position to provide services. At the same time, as we speak about this refugees, uh, 25 million refugees, you have also a very protracted refugee situation that still was no solution. You have refugees in Sudan since 1968, you have refugees in, in Kenya since 1991, you have refugees in Algeria since 1975, and you have refugees for over 30 years in Pakistan. These are a very protracted refugee situation, and I don't think uh, any of the delegates or the head of state uh, came up with a solution to solve this problem. In the meantime, as you know, the number of refugees are trying to go to up north uh, is also increasing. It's not dying. And the number of refugees uh, not getting asylum is also increase, increasing. So it's a, it's a mixed feeling for me, even though it was major gathering uh, and, uh, and a lot of discussion on every aspect of the refugee life was discussed. Uh, but at the end of the day, you know, our refugees going to be given the right to work, the right to go to school, the right to own business, uh, the right to have education, all of these things uh, remain the same. Well, um, uh, Nagash, a lot of the times yeah. when there are conferences, uh, there are pledges, 
and some commitments that are made. What is different this time around? Because some of these pledges sometimes do not get realized. Well, I think, you know, you're right. You know, these are pledges, you know, and I don't know to what extent they are binding pledges, meaning you know, you know, the, the companies or the government will actually contribute. But the magnitude is different. You know, I, I would say you know, the pledges were close to, you know, um, uh, several billions of dollars, you know, when you take also in kind of things. Uh, it, it's remarkable. Again, the, it's not going to be solving the refugee uh, situation. You know, they're, they're still a house in refugee camp for many, many years, as I mentioned. Uh, they have no future. Uh, they, you know, they can still keep in the refugee camp for 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 another decade or more, uh, nobody came up with a solution, you know, what to do with them. But in the meantime, I guess the pledges and the amount of money given perhaps will give uh, some refugees a chance to go to school um, uh, or start a business, a micro-enterprise business. Uh, so there is some hopeful discussion again uh, at, at the end of the day, you know, uh, if one has to check whether this uh, is happening or just simply uh, a promise and I've done the work. Eskinder Nagash is president and CEO of the U.S. Committee on Refugees and Immigrants. We'll come to you again. I am Bior, let me come to you. Um, you've been reporting on refugee issues. Um, tell me about your experience in your reporting stories on that. Well, if I can just say the fact that you have two former South Sudanese refugees at the table, I think is emblematic of just how big the issue on the South Sudan side is. Um, I am from South Sudan and I was born during the second civil war. Um, so because of that, I wasn't able, um, I wasn't born in South Sudan. I was born next door in Ethiopia. And then I eventually grew up in Kenya. Um, and we actually passed through Kakuma refugee camp um, in the early 90s on our way into Nairobi. Um, since then, I mean, I've, I've become a journalist. I like, like many refugees, they, they hope to, you know, get an education and, and get jobs and, and live their lives. I've been very fortunate enough to do that. But as we've heard so far, it's hard for a lot of refugees to do that. Um, um, as a reporter, I have spoken to countless refugees, and I think that the situation is grim, if I'm being completely honest with you. You look at a camp like Kakuma. When Kakuma was, um, was made in, in the early 90s, it was a temporary solution. And now, you know, I went back just there. I was, just a, I was there just a couple of months ago, and I spoke to people who had been there their entire lives, you know, who met their wives there, who um, gave birth to their children there, and that it's become a permanent solution for them. Um, and, and Kakuma was supposed to be a temporary uh, kind of solution, correct? Right, yeah. I mean, it was, and uh, most refugee camps are supposed to be temporary solutions. Um, you know, no one thinks that they are going to live their entire life in a refugee camp. That's unfathomable to the refugees and I believe to the international community. Um, but the problem is, when we do speak to refugees, what they tell us is the reason that they left is because they had to, because in, in the case of South Sudan, it's because of conflict. Sometimes it's also because of the weather. There's drought, there's floods. And, and they have to leave their um, they have to leave their their countries. Um, but but in the case of conflict, what we keep hearing from them is that the only solution that there is is a political one. And so they're kind of stuck between a rock and a hard place um, because they want their leaders to come to a political solution to to stop the violence. But at the same time, they feel completely powerless in countries that you know aren't really theirs. Luau, let me come to you. Mm. What has been your experience being a refugee? Um, you've chalked some successes here in the U.S. Mm -hmm. What has been your experience? You know, uh, first of all, as Ian mentioned before, like um, as a refugee by myself, a lot of people have this um, idea that uh, when you become a refugee or when you go to a refugee camp, it's a temporary place. But like that is something which you like really think about a way of like these refugees are always there. It's like a permanent home for them. For me, I've lived there for like 20, 22 years. And, uh, and to me, I feel like there's only way we can be able to like help the refugees, even where they are. But I, I'm not going to talk more about like what the organization could do, but like what exactly we need as refugees, because a lot of people think that we are a burden to the society, but we are not. Like we, all, all we want is like opportunities, because these are people that have lost their hope. They have loved what they love. They, all they want is like to start their life. From, from zero because like there's nobody who can just wake up in the morning and leave what they love. So I feel like for me like 
growing up in a refugee camp, it wasn't a choice for me, but it was something that I really want a, a second chance in life where I can be able to live in a peaceful environment, where I can be able to live where I wake up in the morning and I have something to eat, I have something to like survive. But like, I feel like the most important thing is like these refugees need resources, they need um, opportunities, they need education because that can be able to help them and restore their hope and yeah. Let me come to you, Elizabeth. Yeah. Talk to us about forced migration in the context of mixed flows. Right. So Ian mentioned um, some individuals have been displaced by conflict, but also natural disasters. And so that is a growing trend that we are continuing to see. Um, specifically, individuals who haven't necessarily crossed an international border, and those we call um, internally displaced persons, and, and they also have different vulnerabilities and needs um, that we also need to take into consideration. Um, but also, um, again, as, as I mentioned earlier, we have 70, uh, more than 70 million people who have been forcibly displaced, and so that includes the refugees and, and the asylum seekers and internally displaced persons. And so. Um, at IOM, one thing that we uh, do is focusing on mixed flows. We need to cooperate with UNHCR and other agencies um, to make sure that we are meeting the needs and assisting governments to be able to meet some of those operational challenges continues to be at, at our focus. Eskena, let me come to you. You've been involved in refugee issues for a lot of years. What are some of the challenges <laughs> that these refugees face and how um, they can surmount some of these challenges to be integrated into society? Yeah, I think part of the challenge we have, uh, this is the same challenge for the past 20, 30 years, is refugees don't get the right uh, that they deserve, you know, uh, they are entitled to. Under the 1951 Convention, refugees are not supposed to be permanently uh, live in a refugee camp. FURI for the past 15 years has been advocating on behalf of refugees, and we use the term refugee warehousing should stop immediately. Refugees need to give the right, the right to uh, have a business, the right to go to school. They have to have freedom, like a human being. And you know, I you know I appreciate all the the, the gathering that you are doing. I think the work of I is incredible. But at the end of the day, refugees don't seem to have a right. If you are living for 20, 30, 40 years in Africa, you know, then you are actually just warehouse for with no future uh, for you or for your family. So I think that's part of the challenge we have. They, we need to come up with a political solution. Refugees have a world found if you are permitted to go back to their country. There should be a solution, including your settlement is one durable solution. Uh, local integration is another solution. I think Part of the challenge, and, 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 and someone mentioned refugee crisis. I think we don't really have a refugee crisis. I think we have a crisis of with the international community not taking your responsibility. We have a crisis of responsible responses to refugees. So if this refugee crisis is an outcome of a protracted refugee campaign, people don't want to leave the refugee camp forever. And we have people for 50 years, 30, 40 years in Africa. So unless your right is enshrined you know, under the 1951 convention, a lot of the countries were signatories to that convention should actually honor what China. Uh, so I think that's part of the challenge we have. You know, we can have this, you know, this gathering again and again. People will be pledging. But at the end of the day, if it's not based on freedom for refugees, and the right for refugees, all of these places, all this commitment is not going to make a difference. Thank you very much, Eskenda. Eskenda Nagash is president and CEO of the U.S. Committee on Refugees and Immigrants. Let me come to you, Luau. So what can other refugees learn from your experience? Yeah, uh, for me, when I, as, as a game designer and a refugee who became a game designer and also as an African who is an independent game designer, like the most important thing to me uh, is for the refugees to learn that we can be able to achieve anything even if the world has forgotten us. Uh, because we, there's something I always describe, which is like human talent. That's something 
no matter they take what they love from us, no matter what, like uh, we lost the, the people that we love in our life through the war and become refugees, there is that um, second chance in life we all want. We all have the, the capability and the, the mentality to be able to become, create what we love. And, and, and when I learned one day that um, I am passionate about making video game, and then, and because my mother, who was actually a refugee, uh, believed in me when she was in a refugee, it wasn't like someone from, like from a wealthy off country, or it wasn't somebody who was like from a rich family that actually saw what I can be able to do. It was a refugee like me who actually saw what I was doing and invested in me, bought my first computer in a refugee camp. There was nobody having it. And then, but because like to me, like I realized that when I got my first computer and I have to work for three hours every day, it was nothing to me. It was, it was nothing compared to my parents playing the country. So living in a refugee camp became like a, an opportunity for me to be able to see what is the best way I can be able to work my, make my way through and became, become who I am today. So I feel like um, the, the most important thing is that as refugees, we have the, the capability and for them we have the, you know, we can be able to achieve what we want. We can be able to work in one of the best tech companies in the world. We can be able like, to just contribute to the society. You know, when people look at me today, they're like, were you a refugee? Yeah, I was, but they don't look at that. It's not my identity. Right, but it's my root, it's where I come from. So I feel like as refugees, we can be able to like, you know, create our companies, you know, become entrepreneurs, employ people, and we are like contributing to the society. The only difference is that we, we have left what we love, which is our home. Mm. But like, yeah, but I feel like that's the most important issue. Let me come to our yeah, right. and, and, mm -hmm. and to that point, I just yeah. wanted to add, just last yeah. month I spoke to a former lost boy of, of, mm. of, of then Sudan mm -hmm. who uh, won a city council seat in mm -hmm. Syracuse, New York. Mm -hmm. And when I spoke to him, he actually told me that, because mm -hmm. he, he went through Kakuma as well, and he mm -hmm. told me that when he came to, um, to New York, in the city of Syracuse, he realized that the conditions there were very similar to the refugee camp that he had yeah, left. Right. Mm -hmm. And he thought, how, how could this be that this is a first world country, the United States is, why is there high crime rates? Why is there so much poverty? And he decided almost 20 years ago that he would do something about it. So 20 years later, um, he was elected um, to city council and he told me that one of the things that he wants to do um, is, 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 is fix those issues. And I actually didn't notice before, prior to speaking to him, but Syracuse is one of the poorest cities in the United States. It makes the top 10 list every census. Um, so I think that the perspective that he is bringing um, mm -hmm. is, is one that Americans don't have. You know, to go from a, a refugee camp and then to be elected to city council and to use that as a way to kind of um, change the policies in the U.S. Uh, that are fairer um, and, and, and better for people, um, I, I think it will be really fascinating to watch. Mm. Talk to me about some of your reporting. Recently you went uh, to Kakuma, you spoke to teachers. Talk to me about the education system. Uh, is that enough to well equip some of these refugees to be better, to challenge uh, the status quo or to better equip themselves for the future? Well, the students that I spoke to, and I spoke to a lot of students, they are just as ambitious as mm -hmm. any teenagers in the entire world. I mm -hmm. spoke to a young woman um, who just casually said that she wants to be president of the Democratic Republic of Congo one day, because that's, that's where she's from. Mm -hmm. um, and she really, believed that, she really believes that she can indeed do that. Um, I think that you know, even though the refugees in Kakuma are restricted because they have to get special permission to, mm -hmm. to travel around the country, um, they, obviously they're allowed to you know, live and I walk around uh, Kakuma, but mm -hmm. in order to leave Kakuma, um, they have to get um, special permission. Um, so even though that restriction is there, mentally it's not there for a lot of the young people that I spoke to. But I spoke to a lot of teachers who told me that on average, um, they teach about 100 students each class, um, each day, um, and that has become the norm for them. And of course, they don't have enough resources. Um, mm -hmm. They don't have the technology. They don't have, you know, lights. Um, you know, if, if, it, if it gets dark, when the students go home, they don't have lights, you know, in, in their houses to do, um, to do their homework. So there's a lot of issues, um, but I think even within those issues, there's a lot of determination within both the teachers and the students um, to make something of themselves so that, you know, one day that they, they can overcome the, the refugee title that, you know, that they've inherited or that they have. Mm -hmm. Elizabeth, uh, what are the drivers behind migration? 
and what are some of the challenges associated with some of these issues of migration? Yeah. So again, we see we see people compelled to leave for various reasons, um, conflict being one of them, and we just spoke a little bit about natural disasters. But other times, you know, migration isn't necessarily a negative reason that people leave. Some people are leaving to find educational opportunities. In other cases, people might be looking to reunify with family or. Um, in other instances, people leave because there is a lack of access to basic needs, whether it's education or health services, or they find that they're being discriminated against and uh, you know, lack human rights, basic human rights. Um, so there, there are many different drivers that uh, we are seeing. Um, and so it's important, again, to, to be able to contextualize those different situations because every, every migrant and refugee's needs are, are different. Um, and so in terms, in terms of challenges, one um, of the primary challenges, of course, is the vulnerabilities of migrants and, and being able to ensure that we uphold their human rights. Um, that, is, that is critical. But also in the host communities. Um, in, in certain situations like we see in Latin America right now, um, where we have an influx of refugees and migrants from Venezuela, um, that places a strain on, on countries that don't typically see these, these numbers. Um, so it can often be, be a challenge in that sense. But also, I think it marks an opportunity as well. I think Luol's um, story is really inspiring, and it's a testament on how uh, the diaspora can, can also contribute to solutions. So whether it's being sending remittances, so we know that more than, more than $500 billion in remittances last year, um, that, is, that is an incredible opportunity to um, have diaspora organizations being able to contribute to their countries of origin and contribute to development in, in those countries. So I see it as an opportunity as well. But in, in some instances, refugees complain that in the uh, societies or countries that they go to, there's a suspicion of them taking advantage of the system, they take jobs away from the indigents and all that. How do you address some of these concerns? Right, and I think that there's a lot of misinformation out there, and so it is so important to be able to partner with different organizations, with um, academic institutions, to be able to kind of uh, debunk a lot of those misconceptions. And the media, of course, is a very important partner to, to ensure that the debate around migration is, is based on evidence and based on facts. Um, and, and so I think that that is, is something that we need to continue to uh, raise awareness around uh, issues concerning migration. And I think in, in your reporting, did some of these issues come up? Yeah, ab absolutely. And I was just going to say, I think it's also important to include host communities in those conversations. Um, I, Uganda is a really good example. Somebody brought up local integration as a potential solution um, mm -hmm. just a little while ago. Uganda has basically taken that model. And they welcome in refugees um, into their country. Refugees are allowed to work. They're allowed to go to school. In some cases, they're even given a plot of land. The problem is that has created tension between the refugee communities and the local and the local communities. Um, and you know, I I think that you know whether it be officials in the government or officials in the UN, you know, that's an issue that really needs um, to be looked at closely. Just. Just last week, we reported on a refugee incident in northern Uganda where um, at least four people died um, after, after there was a disagreement um, and there was a big fight that erupted afterwards. And so, you know, th these, when, when we talk about what are some of the issues, the issues are actually life threatening because when you think of the host community and they're watching refugees get all this, all the assistance from the UN, they're also thinking, well, I'm also in need. Why am I not getting that help? And so I think that that really needs to be talked about. Mm. Luol, did, did you experience some of these issues they are talking about and how did you surmount <laughs> it? Uh, and now that you are <laughs> successful, do you reach back? to uh, some of the people you had known uh, to help them out? Yeah, for sure, like, uh, as, as someone who, who, who has lived that life, you know, it's, uh, at, and to where I am today, I w would better talk about, you know, what I'm doing than, like, mm -hmm. <laughs> because um, there's so much happening. There's, that these are reality, you know, from, uh, from the local community. And they feel like, hey, you're coming, you take our job, you, you know, you are, like, taking the plot of land and all those stuff happening. But to me, like, um, since I started my company and like now living in the U.S. and also like 
are working too hard. Like the most important thing is now to give back uh, to the refugees and also like represent. And that's why my game, Salam, you know, it's a game that actually put a choice of a, of a player in a refugee for them to understand what is the journey. Because a lot of people right now in the world, they have no idea of, of, of the journey of what refugees have been through. For them, it's just, oh, they're just refugees. But like when they play the game, they really understand what it has taken the refugees like to be where they are today. And from there, it, it, it helped them to learn about empathy and also help them to learn maybe if, a, if someone in the US kids like um, play the game and in the next 10 years, they're going to be in a, in a place of making decision. But because they play the game, then they understand really what it, it took a refugee to become who they are. And then from there, they can be able to make refugees that are actually, uh, they can be able to make like uh, policy that can be able to favor refugees because they really understand what it means about the journey of a refugee. And that's like the most important thing like I'm really working on to be able to see like, I made this game that can really represent refugees and also like make people in the world be able to really get into like the whole idea of like refugees is it's not a burden, it's something that you can be part of. It's something that you can be able like, because game are so powerful, game can be able to like help people make decisions. And that's something I'm really so excited. Um, I just premiered my game about um, at the Game Award and I was really so excited because to be able to see the whole game industry recognize the work that I'm doing and also like to become like the first African to like represent a game at, at the Game Award. And that, that's something like really gave me so much hope that uh, the society and some few people are able to understand uh, the work and things that uh, refugees can be able to do, yeah. So how has been the feedback yeah. um, regarding the game and what impact do you see having on the lives of refugees? There is, uh, there's been so much impact. Uh, there's been so much feedback from people, especially from the game community because we are a community that is defined by people that love what to, what to play. And we've been like having like beta testing the game. And one of the most important thing right now we work on the game is that we have in-app purchases. It's a free-to-play game that, we, that is coming on instant game. So if someone in the game like b buy food in the game to be able to like give the energy to the character who is actually running, you're actually buying someone in a refugee camp food. If you buy water in the game, you're buying water for someone in the refugee camp. If your character is hard and, so, and you need your character to be you know, be held in the game. You're buying medicine for someone in a refugee camp. And to see that, I feel like we can take small steps to be able to change the environment, to be able to change the world. We don't, we don't need like, you know, to me, like that's the only way I can be able to give back to, to my community and where I come from. So, and, and the game industry is amazing. Instant game has over 700 million players. And, and look, people like play my game. So it is something really, I'm really excited to be able to like, be here today and be able to like use my experience as a as a play. Mm. Yeah. Any any input from you, Ian, with your reporting? Well, with my reporting, I, I just want to say that the refu the issue of refugees has become so politicized, yeah. and I think that as reporters we come at it from that angle because we talk to officials, we talk to refugees um, who you know really focus on the political side of it. But it is nice to talk to Lual Mayen and to um, do a story on Lual Mayen to talk about, you know, this part, the, the gaming side of it and, and what um, refugees can contribute back. Um, and, I, and I think that a lot of people resonate with the story, you know, because who, who doesn't like to play video games or mm -hmm. who doesn't like to have fun? Um, but to use that in a way that helps people learn about the, you know, migration issues or refugee issues, um, I think is fascinating. Well, Elizabeth, what are some of the possible solutions yeah. um, to resolve migration issues? Because now you've seen a surge in migration. A lot of Africans and other nationalities are moving to places where they think they can find opportunities to better their lives, to improve their living conditions. So what are some of the challenges? Because there are some uh, suspicions. There are other challenges in host countries where these individuals, you know, uh, reside and face. Right. So when we talk about solutions, we can, we can take a look at two different aspects here. First, again, what compelled those migrants and refugees to leave in the first place? So what types of programs and policies can ensure that people feel empowered to stay within their communities and that they don't have 
you know, that they, they aren't left without a choice to migrate. Um, so that is important, making sure that there are programs and access to basic services in those countries. But in terms of forced migration as a whole and addressing um, the current situation, there's, there's a number of different durable solutions we can discuss. And, and I wanted to talk a little bit about refugee resettlement. And so we know that only a fraction of the world's refugees are able to be resettled to a third country. So we need to explore other pathways, whether it be humanitarian visas or family reunification or labor migration programs that will help uh, not only migrants and refugees, but it will help those communities to meet a certain labor demand in their country. Um, but in, in, in those cases when resettlement isn't an option, but uh, the conditions in their country of origin are conducive to voluntary return, that, that is the most preferred solution. Um, but unfortunately, we don't see that because um, the, the protracted crisis isn't necessarily conducive to have migrants and refugees be able to voluntary re uh, voluntarily return, um, and that could potentially jeopardize their safety. Um, so kind of taking it back to the theme of International Migrants Day this year, um, a focus on integration and social cohesion. I think that there's not enough um, attention on, on that area, and I think that that is a, an area where we need to take a look at how we can best support. And that is important to involve everyone. Um, so governments, NGOs, humanitarian actors, development actors, um, and the diaspora. Um, I think that there's a role for everyone to play um, in different solutions and, and and so in social cohesion and integration, I think is another area that Religious we Religious groups as well? Of course. All right, well, <laughs> you are tuned into Straight Talk Africa. We'll have more of our discussion in a moment. We appreciate all of the audience feedback. Straight Talk Africa streams live every Wednesday on Facebook. You can catch our show here and leave a comment. Now let's look at what's on tap for next week's program. On the next Straight Talk Africa, Nana Kunedu Ajeman Rawlings, the former First Lady of Ghana, reflects on the importance of empowering others and using public office to serve Ghanaian citizens an in-depth discussion with Nana Kunedu Ajeman Rawlings on the next Straight Talk Africa. Today we are discussing the global refugee crisis. Our guests include Elizabeth Lizama from the International Migration um, and then INBO viewer reporter and co-host of Our Voices, Lual Mayen, CEO of Junoob Games, Eskinda Negash, President and CEO of the U.S. Committee on Refugees and Migrants. He had left. But let me come to you, Ian. You wanted to ask something before we went on a short break? Oh, no, I'm good. All I'll, right. I'll let, let you ask the question. All right, now let, let me come to you, uh, <laughs> Elizabeth. What are some yes. of the best practices to promote acceptance of diversity and facilitate inclusion of migrants? Yeah, I think we're seeing a lot of different examples. And... Um, you know, on one end, we can look at best practices in socioeconomic integration, so um, creating jobs and empowering migrants and refugees to be able to start their own businesses. Because in turn, 
um, becoming entrepreneurs, they're going to hire. They're going to hire people from the local communities and be able to contribute to their host communities. Um, but also being able to offer training and support assistance um, so that migrants and refugees have the proper tools to meet those labor demands and access the labor markets in their host communities. Um, but also, there's, there's opportunities for cultural and social integration, and so that could be in terms of using the art. So um, one, one example in Niger, we have um, different uh, migrants, refugees, host community members engaging in street mural projects. And so um, another example in another country um, where we have migrants, refugees, and host community members in, in musical programs. So there's a, a lot of different um, examples also in education and making sure that uh, students, that children have access to education um, and that they're being able to, to integrate. And um, so we, we see a lot of different examples and, and best practices around the world. Ian, you initially spoke about you being a refugee. Mm -hmm. How was it like for you? Well, um, it was not good. Um, I, I think for me and my family, my mom especially, it was very hard on her um, because my dad was not with us. He was, um, he was part of the SPLA, so he was fighting the war. Um, and so she walked with us all the way into Ethiopia um, to give birth to me. And then while she was there, she then had to raise kids all on her own. Um, and, you know, th this was a time, this was in the late 80s. So when she gave birth to me, she didn't have really any proper medical doctors around her. Um, so there was that issue. Um, and then once she gave birth to me, she was constantly worried about losing me. My mom has lost four kids. Um, you know, all of them passed away before the age of two. Um, and so that's the grim reality, I think, for um, a lot of refugee parents around the world is, you know, just hoping that they can raise their children into adulthood. And before you even think about that, or after you think about that, you know, then you have to worry about feeding them. You have to worry about, you know, will they get proper education? Um, if they do get proper education, will they get jobs? There, there's, I think there's a constant worry among refugees. Um, and when one need is filled, then, then the next worry begins. Mm -hmm. um, so I think for us, I think we were like any other refugee family out there. Um, you know, we really just had to hope that something would happen. And um, eventually something did. But of course, that's not the same for millions of people out there. Mm. Luau, what was your journey like? I mean, you said you did, somebody bought you a computer. But how did you become a refugee? T take me through the process. Yeah, it's, it's like the same with most of South Sudanese. Uh, you know, because of the war that began in, in South Sudan, my, my family has to flee the war. And during the war, I was actually not born. I was born on the way. Uh, if, if you look actually at my game, like it's um, the same place that I was born in Amer. It's, it's, um, it's set in the game, like in a, in a mountainous place. And I, uh, I was born, and then from there, we went to northern Uganda. Uh, it wasn't easy for, you know, for a child who was born on the way to be able even to survive. Nobody knew that I was going to survive because, like, there's no food, there's no even milk that I can be able to, like, have as a child. But, like, growing up in a refugee camp, it wasn't, like, an, an easy journey because you, you need education, you need uh, inspiration because even, like, when, you, when pe most of the people live in a refugee camp, they have, like, no inspiration because all they need is, to, like, to be able to survive. Uh, but, like, during that moment, I... I, I was so creative. I really wanted something for myself, also for my family, to be able to like. Uh, with my my mother has been so helpful to me to be able to like look at important of education and also like be able to understand that all I need is it's 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 to be like to make myself a better person. And when I saw my computer the first time during um, a refugee registration, that moment actually helped me to understand that hey. I want to use a computer one day, and I don't care what, whatever it's going to take me to be able to use a computer. And, and from there, I, was like, I just trained myself. I used like, online tutorials. Like, there was no internet in a refugee camp. There was, no, like, there was no, nobody to be able to teach me how to code. But for me, like, I, I was like, if my mother can be able to work hard and buy for me a computer in a refugee camp, it changed everything for me that for me, I can be able to do it. So I started like, learning myself, uh, training myself how to code. Uh, one day, someone installed for me a video game on my computer, uh, Grand Theft Auto, and then I started playing it, and I was like, wow. You know, I never thought video games are made by people because I was living at a place 
where you actually had knew nothing about video game. Even when I had the inspiration to be able to create games, all I wanted was to be able to create something not for the world or not for people in the game industry to play. I really wanted to create something for refugees that they can be able to play something they can be able to like come together and play. And from there, like, it, it, it was more than just vi vision. It was more than because what I created was what people want in the world. And then, and then from there, I remember like in a refugee camp, there was no internet. I can be able to distribute the game. The game was less than 10 MBs. So I, I used Bluetooth to be able to send the game, which was like the most craziest thing someone mm -hmm. has ever done in the video game industry. But all I want, I wanted like refugees to have something to be able to play. My focus was, you know, I want to make them happy. I want to make them play a game. And then from there, like, I am here, like I'm creating the game for the world. I have a company that, that we, we can be able to like make game for impact. And right now, my game is, is coming out and I see like the, the industry like supporting what I'm doing. So it's, it's, um, it's, it's possible, yeah. And it's Peter, right. yeah. you mm -hmm. should note that it took his mom three yeah. years to save up three hundred dollars to mm -hmm. buy Lol his first computer. Mm -hmm. And so, when we talk about possible solutions, I think that um, job creation is really mm -hmm. important because even in a progressive place like Uganda, or at least progressive towards uh, towards refugees, mm -hmm. in a progressive place like Uganda, it still took his mom years to raise that 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 amount of money. Um, so you can imagine how hard it is to make a living mm -hmm. even in a place like Uganda. Mm -hmm. You know. People have talked about solutions to resolving this uh, migrant and refugee crisis. They've mentioned the Ugandan model. Some say the Ethiopian model could be effective in some areas. In your reporting, what have you seen? Well, so Uganda and Ethiopia are, I think, really good examples, as you just said. We talked about Uganda just a little while ago. Um, Ethiopia is trying to integrate refugees into their societies as well. Um, but then we see other countries like Kenya who they've threatened to close down camps, you know, every every so often they threaten to close down Dadaab refugee camp. Um, their officials have said that they don't want refugee camps in the country for, you know, for, for various reasons. So I think even within the region, um, there's a diversity in how officials take on this issue. And that's been really fascinating for me to watch. Um, but like I said, you know, Kakuma, um, this, this is a place that has become a permanent solution for, um, for a lot of its residents. The same with Dadaab. So if you do close down those camps, then where do these hundreds of thousands of people go? And so these are the questions that the officials really need to answer. Um, because the officials who don't want there to be refugee camps in their country, where will, where will refugees go? Mm. Uh, Elizabeth, I understand IOM faces some of these challenges. Migrants are expelled. Uh, some countries don't even want to accept them uh, because of various reasons that they pose. How do you resolve some of these concerns? Right. And so that, that is a very uh, complex situation and it's very, um, it depends on, on different situations. And so I think that in, in one area, say in Bangladesh or Libya or in Latin America, it, it requires a different uh, approach um, specific to the needs. Having the migrants and refugees at the core of the response is, is important. Um, but also, again, thinking through a multi-stakeholder approach and, and a whole of society where everyone plays a role in being able to address these issues is super important um, between governments, between um, international organizations. No one country is going to be able to address this issue alone. And so it is important to, to make sure that we are being able to foster these partnerships to um, find, find durable solutions. Mm. Yeah, and the very, the very nature of, of refugees demands that at least multiple countries you know, uh, take a stab at the issue. Mm. Uh, Elizabeth, one of the solutions that I have heard people talk about is opening up safe routes to sanctuary. Uh, sanctuary for refugees is one important aspect that they talked about uh, for both refugees and immigrants. What is your organization doing about this in terms of convincing uh, host governments to ensure safe passage for these refugees? Because sometimes some of these refugees are caught up, mm -hmm. you know, at the crossfires with the opposing sides. Right, and that, and that is a very important issue that we continue to work on because the 
vulnerabilities that migrants and refugees face when they decide to take irregular routes. We see smuggling and trafficking, and so that is, is a major concern. And so working with governments to be able to find different types of programs that are that work for, for those countries, and again, it, it depends on the situation. Um, so whether it's being able to find a solution and find, um, whether it be humanitarian visas or um, other types of programs that can uh, offer some type of solution and that we, again, are, are able to promote safe and, and orderly migration so that migrants and refugees aren't forced to take these irregular channels. I, and people have also talked about resettling, and you've seen of you know your in your reporting people have been you know resettled and all that. But what about the issue of trafficking? Because some individuals take advantage of refugees and traffic them. Yeah, that's that's a really big issue, I think, um, and I think that human trafficking. Um, it, it preys on vulnerable individuals. Um, a, a lot of them are, of course, um, I, asylum seekers or, or refugees trying to escape um, violence. Um, and I, I, I think that this is an issue that is not talked about enough. Um, this is an issue that, quite frankly, is underreported because it's really hard to report on, on human trafficking. It's, it is a hidden crime. Um, and I, I think that I think that more reporting is needed um, to at least warn refugees or asylum seekers of, of what is ahead of them, because there are people in, you know, in, in, in their journey who are there to simply take advantage of them. Um, but I think, that, I think that you make a, val a valid point, because no one really talks about this. Um, but we have heard from women who, um, who know that along the way that, that there might be you know, men who will try to exploit them. Um, we've heard from women who carry condoms with them because they know that they might get raped wrong, uh, along the way. Um, so you know, I, I, think, I, I think that just more information towards, towards victims, more information towards refugees and asylum seekers, uh, just, they know, just so they know some of the potential dangers along the way um, could help. But at the same time, um, I think that officials within the countries also need to do a lot more to catch perpetrators um, before they do get to the uh, vulnerable communities. Mm. Some people have also talked about the issue of trafficking with the undertones of racism. Before I come to you to talk about it, I saw you shaking your head. Loa, mm. what did you want to say? No, I'm good. <laughs> All right. Now, so let, let, let's talk about trafficking with the undertones of racism, and that some of these host government will need to address some of these concerns because, um, although it's not on the surface, it happens quite often mm -hmm. for both migrants and refugees. How do you resolve them as a, a, a leading organization handling immigration and uh, uh, migration? Yeah, that is one area that we focus a lot on as Ian mentioned, being able to prosecute those traffickers. So we assist governments in being able to, one, be able to identify um, situations of trafficking, and that can be very difficult tasks to do. Um, so we do assist governments in being able to bolster their uh, local authorities, being able to identify and prosecute uh, uh, traffickers. Um, but also providing assistance to those uh, who have been trafficked. Um, one other area that I wanted to discuss, and, and I think um, I am brought a, a really interesting point, and, and it kind of speaks to the tragic situation that some individuals are in that they would choose to continue um, despite knowing the vulnerabilities that a woman might be raped along the way. Um, and. Given that, uh, we do work a lot with, with migrants um, in different areas. In particular, we had a very successful program in West Africa where we had migrants um, be able to share their stories and tell their communities, this, these are the risks. And, and so we've seen some, uh, some successes out of that program. And of course, um, when people feel like they have no other choice to migrate, they're going to continue despite knowing the risk. But that is also another important um, area that we try to, to raise awareness through different means and being able to amplify those stories of other migrants who have um, experienced this journey and experienced the exploitation, um, have been trafficked. That is a, another important area. And, and Jules, yeah. oh, right, you wanted to say something? Yeah, I was going to add about like what I mentioned about uh, resettlement because um, I think with my personal experience, like, like um, First of all, with most of the organizations that are really responsible for like um, resettlement, 
there is there's, there should be like a clarity between the refugees and also like the time period of how long are they going to wait for them to be resettled because this is something like refugees have no idea and that's where they're like uh, they get tired of waiting but if they really understand like for my family we have been um, we try to reset resettle for more than 20 years and we have been rejected for like 10 years to like resettle with no I with no like with no reason so I think that when it comes to like the resettlement it's something like most of the refugees like are excited about but it's also like something like there should be like a clarity and say hey this is a time period or like this is what is happening so that they really understand and then from there they, they know exactly who are like organizations that are responsible for doing something like this yeah I think so yeah some governments I understand blame refugees for the economic and social problems they have back home mm. how do you deal with it Elizabeth yeah um, so I think um, there's a lot of different factors but again I think the importance is um, focusing on on the facts and, and what the evidence um, suggests and so um, being able to have these frank conversations I think is also important um, but I think again it, it's kind of different situations call for different responses but I think uh, more conversation is, is obviously necessary to to be able to address some of the solutions that um, might actually have some merit. Mm. I, and in your reporting did you see this because one of the solutions that um, has been proposed so far is that government should stop blaming refugees for some of the problems they have back home. Well I think Part of the problem is that it has become very politicized and so you have politicians who use um, refugees as a talking point to you know either speak to their constituents either one way or the other um, and I mean I think you're absolutely right I think the facts are there um, and, 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 and the facts speak to themselves um, really um, and when you when you look at a country like South Sudan where we're both from um, you know I don't I think it'd be pretty hard to look at a refugee and say it's your fault that self Fakir and, mm -hmm. and and Rick Machar are fighting um, or I think it'd be hard to look at a refugee and say you know there was a cyclone in your village um, and now your home is completely wiped out and you have no more living that must be your fault as well um, and so I'm not sure who is blaming refugees um, but I'm not surprised to hear that there is some blame on, on refugees because it is such a highly political issue mm -hmm. and I don't think that we're gonna stop hearing from uh, the, these talking points from politicians especially um, with the election seasons coming up but but again, to your point, we're just going to have to really listen to the facts and know what the facts are um, and, you know, use them in, in our reporting. Uh, Elizabeth, before we go, does the IOM see asylum as a human right? And do you talk to government of uh, migrants who want to resettle in their countries or refugees who want to settle in their countries to look at it from that perspective? Right. So in terms of asylum, um, you know, one thing is national governments have the sovereignty to manage um, migration and to uh, set policies for, for their own governments. But it is important um, that when doing so, that they respect uh, international law and uphold their obligations. Well, before we go, Ian, briefly, what are some of the prospects that you see, hope, of some of these refugees that you interacted with? Well, for the case of South Sudan, um, we've heard from aid agencies that a lot of South Sudanese are indeed going back um, to, to their homes. Um, largely, that's because of a ceasefire uh, that was agreed upon last year, uh, which has been the longest holding ceasefire um, in, in South Sudan's uh, history since the conflict began. Um, and so that is good news, um, but still there are a lot of uh, refugees and IDPs um, who are not returning home. Um, so I think right now it's kind of a mixed bag. Um, there is, uh, we we see both conditions kind of happening sim, you know, simultaneously. Um, but, but but I think you know returning back home is a very personal choice, um, and we, no one can make a refugee return back home unless they want to. Mm -hmm. um, so I think, and and you know, with the case of South Sudan, it's still a tumultuous situation. We have no idea uh, what's going to happen come February. Um, mm -hmm. So it's it's wait to we'll wait we'll, we'll see we'll see what happens. <laughs> right, yeah. On that note, our guest today were Elizabeth Lizama, Ian Bjorn. Well, Mayen, Lisa Bryant, and Eskinda Negash. Thanks to our audience for tuning in to Straight Talk Africa and have a great evening. <laughs>